Hey all, welcome to another episode of Pounds to Kilos. My guest today is James Hobart. It's uh, difficult to know where to start in terms of introducing James. There's so much that he's done in CrossFit. Um, I remember my first time seeing James was actually when he would used to appear on workout demonstrations on CrossFit.com in the very early years. Um, And then I was fortunate enough to work with him as part of the Level 1 seminar team, which he's been a part of for a very long time. Of course, I've watched him like many of you would have as an individual competitor at the Games. The last time we did that was 2014. And then he was part of the successful affiliate team in CrossFit Mayhem that won the Affiliate Cup in 2015 and 16. But probably, um, and as he introduces himself in this episode, um, James's biggest contribution of CrossFit is just being a, an outstanding trainer to anybody that has uh, been fortunate enough to train under him, be that in the seminar environment or in the affiliate environment in which he has a lot of experience. And just with all the different um, roles and um, hats that he's worn in CrossFit, I just knew it would be a really great um, opportunity to talk to him about you know, uh, anything and everything CrossFit, not just the sport but also things that go down in an affiliate environment as well. So um, I think you'll really enjoy this episode from somebody who has a heap of experience. You'd you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody with more experience in all the different facets of CrossFit uh, than James. Um, So enjoy and keep converting pounds to kilos. It's stuffed up. Um, Okay, let's make a start. James, welcome to Pounds to Kilos. Man, it's a pleasure to have you on. I was thinking to myself how I should introduce you or what order I should introduce you as, as CrossFit seminar staff member, affiliate trainer, individual games athlete, team games champion. Of those, and maybe I've missed a few, in fact, I know I have, how would you introduce yourself? What would be the first thing you would introduce yourself as? Um, what I tell most people walking the door to my affiliate is I'm just one of the coaches here. You okay. know, I, would probably, I would probably start with my name. Hi, I'm James Hobart. That's a reasonable um, place to start. But usually I just, most people come into my gym. If you're, if you're new to it, it's just, I'm just, Hey, I'm James. I'm one of the coaches here at the gym. That's kind of how it rolls. Now, um, while we're on the gym, what's, uh, what's the name of your affiliate and whereabouts are you located, man? Cause this is mainly an Australian audience that listens. Very cool. So the affiliate I own, which is kind of a cool story, but long story short is the first affiliate I was really a, a member of and, and coached at, which was CrossFit Boston. And then two years ago, uh, Austin Maliolo and another business partner of ours, uh, JC Del Rio, we purchased the gym from the previous owner. So we now own CrossFit Boston. And um, our gym name, our gym business name is uh, CrossFit uh, One Nation Boston. Oh, awesome. Now, yeah. you've been involved in a few affiliates over over the journey. I didn't know that CrossFit Boston was the first one you'd been involved in, but you were also at CrossFit New England for a time. Is that right? Yeah, so when I moved to Boston in 2000 and let's call it nine, I believe, uh, I started going to CrossFit Boston. And then a couple of years later, I started making my way out to CrossFit New England and um, into their location out in Natick, which is probably, oh, I don't know, 20, no, let's, I'll say 30 minutes west of the city of Boston. Yep. Now, um, I, our relationship, we, we first met each other on a seminar when we were both working a seminar in Australia. So you're not just glued to Boston. You get yourself around the world teaching the level one and two seminars. How, how long have you been doing that for? Um, I think it'll be, ooh, I think it'll be 10 years this October. Oh, wow. Yeah. And in that time, like just take our audience briefly through like, uh, where around the world you've had to travel for that stuff? I mean, I've been pretty fortunate, you know. Um, I grew up in a really small town of about 1,100 people, Otis, Massachusetts. Maybe it was more than that. Maybe I exaggerate. But my graduating class from grade school was like 100 kids, maybe less. Okay. Might have been even less than that. So tiny little wow. town. And then from I, I, I think I've essentially taught a CrossFit seminar on every continent on the planet other than Antarctica. Wow. You know, I um, beg. I begged for a long time. There was a, there was a, there used to be an affiliate down at uh, one of the research stations in Antarctica. And I begged, 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 uh, some of the powers to be, to go down there. <laughs> um, I was like, I don't care if it's one person, like, let me do it, you know? Cause it would literally be the lowest air squad on the planet, you know? <laughs> so, I don't know. You've got a pretty low air squad already. 
stupid but cool stupid but cool but yeah it's uh I've, I've been everywhere i've been so lucky to uh you know see crossfit in, in a lot of different countries and different parts of the globe and um you know parts of the world i never ever thought i would go to so i've been pretty fortunate absolutely now dude I, I, there's so many different reasons that i wanted to get you on and lots of different things that i wanted to to talk to you about but for me you're somebody who champions the the program at an affiliate level as well as anyone I've ever seen, but then you've had this exposure to it at the top competitive level. So um, to take us through your experience as a competitor, just briefly, uh, your last individual year, if I'm not mistaken, was 2014. Is that right? Yeah, it's five years ago. It makes me feel old, but yeah, 2014 was my last uh, individual, individual games appearance. Um, I tried to compete at regionals in 2017, I think. Yep. And I broke my foot. Okay. And so that was, that was kind of like my last outing as a, as a region, as an individual competitor. And then last team, uh, comp or 20, it was 2018 regionals. I broke my foot. doesn't matter. Um, and then, uh, last team was 2016. Yep. And that, that last team was the, the CrossFit mayhem team that ended up being the affiliate champions yep. the two years you were in it. Yep. Um, do you, do you have any plans to go back to it, or was the was the broken foot the catalyst for, to call it call time on it, or was it always going to be your last year, 2018 or 17 or whatever it was? Yeah, I I mean I think at that time when when I when I decided to move back up to Boston from Tennessee, I mean I think at that time I had kind of you know really thought to myself, hey, I'm going to start alloc allocating resources to th things other than than just trying to win or show up to the CrossFit Games. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny because people ask, like, you know, are you going to compete again? And I feel like I'm a competitive person. Um, yep. When I do the Open, I really want to do well. You know, I tried hard the last couple of years I've done the Open. I've, you know, for me, I've had some finishes that I was proud of. Yep. Um, you know, whether you scale a workout or not, I'll tell you, if I'm in a class working out against you, like, I still want to beat you. It's not in a mean way. I just, I, I'm a competitive oh, guy. Dude, so. dude, I've just lost you for a second. Oh, <clears throat> back get me back yet yes i just got that response can you go um i'll just ask that that question again like do, do you yeah. have any do you have any aspirations to return to the competition floor was that was that the end of it as planned yeah, yeah short answer is just not in a formal way um, yep. you know, like I, I feel like I'm a competitive person and I'll always be competitive in some sense, but as far as like putting in the, you know, the, the full-time job, 40 hours a week to competing. Yeah. I mean, I definitely am moved on from that, you know? Okay. Now, one of the, the things that I've seen you do well over the years is that there seems to be somewhat of a distinction between CrossFit, the training program for GPP and then CrossFit the sport and how one would train for that. Um, you've you've always been able to sort of champion both of them at the same time. Do, do you see a really distinct difference between the two, or do you see one as just a, a really high expression of the other? Um, I think I see one as a, a high expression of the other. I, I do, you know, what I do like about the program, and you know, I've, I've said this a couple times recently. And I get to say to level ones, which are like one of the things I like most about the program is that, you know, CrossFit um, can be meant for the fittest athlete or the most novice athlete coming into your gym. You know, I really appreciate that aspect of it. The biggest difference I see between training for even if it's not the games, if you're training for uh, multiple CrossFit competitions a year is versus just going into your gym and getting fitter is just the scope of the goal. OK. Um, you know, and so, yeah, I, I think I think one's just a, a much more uh, aggressive is not the right word, but uh, a different, ex you know, one is a different expression of kind of the same fundamental idea. Yep. At, at your affiliate CrossFit One Nation, do you, do you sort of not segment, but do you, do you get people to identify as, yes, I want to train for a competition and they undertake different things or does everybody mainly follow the same program? Uh, so at, at our affiliate, um, we everyone kind of follows the same program. And, you know, this was something I picked up from CrossFit New England a long time ago. When I was at CrossFit New England for a while, 
and training with those guys and Ben Bergeron, one of the things that they were doing is the, the affiliate followed a separate program than their competitors. And Ben was always really big on the notion of like, hey, if I, you know, ran a running club, part of the running club would be training some of those athletes to compete in running. Maybe yeah. some just show up to be, you know, weekday warriors. But he took that same mentality to the affiliate. He's like, I understand not everybody here is going to compete. But he's like, you know, one of the big things I'm going to offer is the opportunity for people to train and compete in this sport of fitness. Um, but anyway, so they had they had class uh, programming and then they had competitors programming and they were different. And what we found out was the class had no buy in to support the competitors right. and the competitors were removed and aloof toward the class. So one of the things he started doing was he started, you know, he gave both the same core programming. So if he was programming for competitors, they had, you know, the same, they had at least one same component as the class. The competitors might do other things because they had the yep. time to do it. They're not just looking for that one hour a day of fitness. What was really cool about that is it brought everyone closer together. It gave people a common ground to chit chat and talk and sure. support each other. So at our gym, we kind of did the same thing. Um, you know, we have, we have a handful of athletes. We have a lot of fit athletes in our gym, you know, at, at all levels, but, uh, we have a handful of athletes who are doing some local competitions, you know, trying to get into the, the you know, scale divisions of some sanctionals or stuff like that. But I would say in terms of um, competitive development, I don't think it's a huge thing we push at our gym. Sure. And I, I would also say I think we're still, you know, at our affiliate cross at Boston, we're still pretty new and we're still pretty young in terms of that. Um, you, you would have had some ex like exposure to questions about competition probably similar to what i'm asking you now when doing level ones um has the competitive aspect of crossfit been overemphasized by certain parts of the community at time like people getting obsessive with you know oh, at the games there might be this so we're going to program like that or whatever it is or uh, is the balance been fair you know as far as you know people get a little too obsessive or taking taking it to an extreme yeah i definitely think it's happened you know, I think it's happened at an affiliate level and, and people try to overlay it on, you know, just to everyday gym goers who, like I said, just want to come in and get fit and live a better life. I've seen that happen. But I also think, you know, in teaching seminars and traveling around, going to other CrossFit affiliates, I've definitely seen, you know, a, a course correction slowly and naturally. Yep. And I think part of that just is by the fact that one is, you know, Someone once said to me, hey, if I have an athlete who just loves being in the gym and wants to work out three times a day and is safe doing so, he's like, why should I tell them not to? You know, it's like they like mm. being here. They have they have the time to do it. Most people don't. You know, yeah. so why not? And, and, and I can definitely vibe with that. And I like that idea. I also think some, you know, affiliate owners just kind of got tricked into the notion that <clears throat> at some point, you know, in order to continue to make progress for their athletes, their athletes had, had to train like games. And the truth is that's not the case. You know, like okay. the most. How, how do they need to train? That's interesting. You know, I would say for, for you know, 99.9% .9 of athletes coming into your affiliate, they need, you know, five to, you know, let's call it five days a week, warm up, workout, cool down. And I think if you do that coupled with, you know, a positive environment, uh, community, whatever that looks like. And uh, you keep people safe. And over time, you slowly ratchet up the difficulty that they're exposed to. I think there's a lifetime of fitness improvement in that. You know, I really, I really do. And, um, you know, I, I've seen that anecdotally in gyms. I see it, you know, my mom started CrossFit at 54. She's going to be 60 next year. She's only gotten fitter as she's got gotten older, you know, which is a yeah. wild thing to say. I I train less now than I ever have when I was competing, and I still will make some PRs and personal bests on stuff. Um, so I just think we forgot that, and maybe not forgot it, but just you know got focused on hey, if games athletes are training five six times a day, or they're training you know four hours a day, then you know we might probably need to do that for our own athletes, but the the beauty of CrossFit and why I started doing it is, you know, the variance, the intensity, the community piece, scaling it for somebody's needs that, you know, and it could last anywhere from five to 20 minutes, you know, that will provide you decades of fitness.
I think I totally agree that not everyone needs to take that step from right. I've done the classes for a little bit. Now it's time to change uh, a ter- change to games games athlete training. But I guess this leads me to another point. I'm I'm really keen to ask you about if if not training like a games athlete then what's the one thing that most people would need to do to take their training to the next level? I, I, I know that's a very broad question about millions of people, but in terms of like the pillars of the program, what would be that thing that, that takes someone towards being more competitive without just increasing volume like crazy? Yeah, awesome. Oh, yeah, so perfect. Yeah, what I was going to say is the thing that takes someone to the next level is they got to look at a goal. But you said, you know, you kind of said takes them to be more competitive. Um, yep. Aside from more volume, well, you know, the first thing I would look at is uh, I would kind of find what is the next immediate competitive stepping stone. Okay. I meet so many, I meet so many people who, not so many, but I meet enough people who are like, "Hey, I'm going to compete at the CrossFit Games," and I'm like, "Awesome, that's great." And uh, there are just so many steps between saying that at a CrossFit level one seminar or, you know, week one of being into an affiliate and then getting to the CrossFit games there, especially yep. now that it's become, you know, more of an organized sport where there are people, other people who have been doing it for years who are still training and have methods that are tried and true to try and get to the game. So, you know, you're swimming against bigger fish. Yeah. So I think what is really important is look at the next immediate competitive step. Mm-hmm. Um, from there, I would take a really, you know, I would take a really close look at probably, I, I, you know, I don't want to go out and say get a coach, but, you know, if you, because if you're able to kind of self-evaluate on, hey, here's where I stack up, you know, um, if you're able to do that well, very well, I would, I would take a look at that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I think no one really looks at to start off with is, you know, I would probably brush up on technical capacity and skill before I'd start worrying about strength right off the bat. Okay. So most people tend to to be like, yep, I need to get stronger. Like these people at the games are moving weights that I can't move. That has to be my first port of call. But but you're saying that the technical or the mechanics is probably where it's at. I just think it's a I think it's a better place to start. Um and the reason I think that is, is because while you're refining those things, you will also get stronger. Yep. Whereas if you're just hammering weight on a barbell and your movement's shitty, uh, it's just, it, it doesn't, you know, it's like you can focus on only strength and miss a lot of the technical skill refinement, mechanics refinement. Whereas yep. the other way, I think you get a little bit of both. Okay. Yeah, I think you that's know, and uh... I, I, I think that's really important. I think, and you know, there are other little things, you know, I try and tell people, you know, it's like, you got to find, you got to find other people and train with them yep. and you got to find people you don't like to lose to and who are just a little bit better than you. Hmm. You know, it's, I don't remember who was some, might've been a boxing movie or something like that. It might've been Rocky, but it's like, you know, that, that notion of like, you always fight chumps. Someday you're going to wake up and you're going to be a chump kind of deal. You know, if you're always kicking everybody's butt in your gym, you got to go out and get smashed a little bit. Yeah. I don't, you know not a lot of people want to go through that. And and I think some of the best athletes in the world, that's what I like so much about Matt Fraser's, you know, you know, the fact that he's kind of, he's just crushing it right now is, you know, the year he got beat by Ben Smith at the games, he kind of went back home and was like, man, you know, I kind of went in there with this attitude of like, I could just kind of stroll in and he got whooped and that changed how he trained, you know, yeah, he had been good enough for everybody else except for that that big stage and he got there and he lost and that kind of that totally changed how Matt attacked the games and I think that's why I think it's so important you got to lose every once in a while if you really want to win big you know Mm, that's uh that's some really sound advice and I'm sure there's lots of people who are the big fish at their affiliate that, that would be listening to that thinking can I can I action something like that can I ask briefly before we moved on and move on that you you went and trained with Rich Froning prior to your last individual games. Um, was was that some of the motive behind it, or was it more you know Rich's programming, or, or what was the motive there? Well, I mean, part of it is uh, I, th- I you know I don't know. We had kind of struck up a friendship, and just uh, you know, obviously there's a lot that Rich does right. You know, with sure. his success as an individual. I think, you know, I don't think 
whether or not Matt, you know, beats Rich's individual record, I just think there are things that Rich has done in the sport that no one will ever be able to do again. Maybe. I don't know. Okay. It's just, you know, between individual team, his longevity in the sport, his performances in the open, like, obviously he's doing something right. Like, I think one of the things, you know, Rich comes off as really casual and nonchalant about his training and his, his intelligence around training and his approach. But clearly, you know, there's something, there's some things that he knows that other people haven't quite figured out for themselves yet. Um, yep. And I won't say that his methods apply for everybody, but, but for himself and his team and what, what, you know, what we were able to do down there and what they're still able to do, he, he definitely has a right. So um, I think part of it was we kind of got along and, um, you know, I wanted to give it a shot as an individual. And I figured it wasn't a bad place, you know, a bad place to train and be around because when you were down there, it's like Rich wasn't the only fit guy. Like everybody was fit down there. Sure. Um, so you really got pushed. I mean, Matt Hewitt, who we competed with super fit, you know, Rich's cousin, Darren, you know, he's, he was down there and he really fit. And, um, you know, Dre, uh, Dre, who didn't come down till later, but uh, who competed on their team this, this year when they won was just like extraordinarily athletic and fit and yep. being down there and just like the, you know, the relentless mentality of and do work, you know, it was like, it was a sink or swim. You either stayed around and got really fit or you stayed there for two weeks and burn out and said, screw it. I'm going home. Yeah. Fair enough. That's, uh, and there were those, pe- there were those people too. Yep. Of know? course. Um, dude, I'm going to change gears on you a little bit. I, I really enjoy like your posts on social media and you, you tend to choose just like a an aspect of CrossFit and, and speak to it a little bit. There was a post recently about scaling that you did and um, I, I don't necessarily want you to regurgitate the post, but scaling is it's potentially one of the things that I've noticed in affiliates that people – uh, still sort of feel like where possible, I should always avoid scaling. Um, and I don't want to like, they sort of still sort of see it as a dirty word. Um, with your time in CrossFit, like, are we getting better at understanding that scaling is simply adapting the program for individuals rather than thinking that it's making the program easier or, or lesser? Yeah, I hope we're, I hope we're getting better at it. You know, I feel like, I feel like that's something, whether we do it successfully or not, I feel like that's something we try and push at our gym. Yeah. I was talking talking to somebody about this the other day, and, you know, it's like, one, you can't stigmatize scaling. It's been a part of our program from the start. All of yeah. us have scaled workouts. All of us will scale workouts again. You know, I try and look at things like RX or scaling rather than, you know, um, rather than like a place mm-hmm. and more of like they're just measuring tools. Okay. You know, the reason I scale somebody is to help deliver the stimulus of the workout to them. Because if the workout was programmed to be a moderate weight, fast workout, low skill, it should feel that way for an athlete who competes at the games level. And it should feel that way for an athlete who just walks in the door. And in order to do that, I got to change things a little bit. You know, and I believe in that. I believe that both athletes need the same things from those workouts, but they need them in different ways amounts and dosage you know doses yeah games athlete needs to squat clean 225 pounds and that might be a moderate loading for a games athlete an athlete coming off the street should still know how to squat clean and squat clean well but maybe a moderate squat clean for someone coming off the street is 95 pounds yeah and i think the sooner you can realize that as a coach and make it an acceptable thing and like i said it's just a measuring tool it's it's part of the program and both athletes still get a high five and a chest bump at the end of the workout. You know, I, I reward both their efforts. Both athletes get a hundred percent of my coaching effort. Um, yeah. So I think we are, I hope, and I think we are getting better at that as a, as a, as a fitness program. Um, I've heard and noticed that there's some programs and gyms that are beginning to move the idea of RX. Um, where, where do you stand on that? And, and, if you're continuing to keep RX in your programming, do you, do you try to think to yourself, right, well, if I put this as the weight, I'm going to have this amount of people RXing it and that and that's good for the community? Or, or do you often try to make it quite difficult to RX workouts? Um, so we program for our affiliate and, and you know, with, with Austin and, and Spencer, Austin Maliolo and Spencer Handel, the three of us do a lot of affiliate programming through uh, the Ham Plan is sort of our, our online programming platform. Yeah. 
And, you know, the way I look at it at RX is it should be something that's just, you know, outside reach for, for, you know, a handful of us. But uh, I still think a lot of athletes should be able to do it RX in your gym. You know, it's something that should be aspirational. Mm-hmm. I always think the CrossFit Games open competition, if anyone's familiar, is a really good example of aspirational programming. Okay. Because when you look at it, nothing on there there are a couple things that you look at and you're like holy shit like you know i'd have i have to be a cirque du soleil strongman to succeed at that workout yeah but a lot of the stuff is is pretty you know simple but not easy and i see a lot of athletes regardless of you know how veteran they are you know doing some of those workouts as prescribed in our in our gyms and then i also see the the top athletes in the world doing the same workout and they're they're blowing it out of the water but um I do think it's important to have something that's a little bit aspirational. What I think is, sorry. No, no, no. Continue, please. I was just say what I think is most important. And, you know, the, the, the gyms, and I read an article about this the other day. I think it was on the morning chalk up and the, the writer was talking about how they took away RX and it was the best thing they've ever done for their gym. And what they do is instead they communicate the stimulus. You know, whether or not your gym has RX or not, every good affiliate out there, every good coach out there, whether they coach CrossFit or some other sport, is trying to communicate, you know, should be communicating the stimulus of the endeavor. Yeah. You know, generally, regardless of, you know, like I said, hey, today's workout, low skill, moderate loading, moderate volume. You want to try and find a weight where you could do five to 10 reps every time. Yeah. They're doing the same thing. You know, whether or not you want to tack the RX on there or not doesn't matter. I mean, you know, at the end of the class, you're still writing up on the board. So-and-so used 185, so-and-so used 95. So I don't, you know, I really don't think it's that big of a deal Mm. um, if if you're already explaining it that way. And if you're already, you know, you're you're cheering people on and, and taking care of them and appreciating, you know, their effort and their ability to apply the stimulus more than a designation next to their name. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned... Ah, damn, I've lost you. I got you. I hear you. I got I got your audio, but I got this sweet shot of you closing your eyes that I'm stuck on, but that's uh, now I've got you again. Okay. Right, back. Awesome. <laughs> I got you. I got you. Um, I'm, I'm interested by what you said about the Open. Um, I think a lot of people view the Open as just like this. This is a competition, and, and no doubt it's that, but... Do people sometimes miss that the open is this really nice um, expression of of CrossFit? Like it's a it's it really pushes us in the direction that that CrossFit was meant to meant to be. Uh, I mean, it's about three or four years ago there was the introduction of dumbbells, and now we see an affiliate program. And there's probably more dumbbells than ever. Is 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 that what the open can do as well as just test? Yeah, I mean, I definitely you know here's here's how I view the open now. I still love it. I love the aspect of the open. I love what um, a little bit of honest competition does to who are normally reasonable, rational adults. It makes them freaking crazy. And I love watching that. I love watching people who are like good, honest, nice people. The open rolls around and they're like going behind their friends back to redo workouts and not telling anybody there's like, I like the madness of it. You know, it's, it's like, it's kind of like this playground craziness. That's it's so super good. fun. But, you know, what I really think the Open is, is it is your, you know, annual fitness checkup. Okay. And, you know, the same way you'd go into a doctor's office and he'd take your blood pressure and your resting heart rate and he'd tell you that you don't eat enough vegetables or whatever they're going to say to you. And they're going to take your body weight, you know, body fat percentage. The Open is is our annual physical fitness checkup. And the thing is, you don't need to be winning the Open you know, to be having a good checkup. Maybe this year you were able to do two more pull-ups than last year, or maybe this year you use the 50 pound dumbbell, or maybe this year, you know, you haven't been working out and, you know, you finished 2000 places, you know, worse than the year before. And you can say, Hey, you know what? Maybe I do need to get back in the gym a little bit because I like being there yep. and it improves my quality of life. That's, you know, that's what I look at it in, t- you know, long term in terms of an affiliate. Um, if people enjoy the competitive aspect of it, great. That's a bonus. Okay. Um, 
Do you get nervous about the Open still now that you're, as you said, slightly less removed from competition, like in a, a less formal? Um, the last two years, I've been crazier about the Open than I ever have. And I think that's because that was the platform where, you know, I didn't have any other platform to compete other than inside the affiliate. Sure, sure. Um, so the last the last two years, I was pretty insane about it. Okay. I think I, I retested more workouts than I ever have. Um, yeah, right. And, uh, and cause for me, it was, like I said, it was, it was kind of like my annual checkup because I knew I wasn't going to be competing on a team or trying to go to a sanctional or make to the games. It was kind of my chance to see like, Hey, now that I'm training less, you know, where do I still stack up? I mean, I want to talk to you about programming, um, because you, you do own the hand plan with Austin and Spencer, um, and you, you would have done programming for a number of affiliates. I can only imagine over the years, um, I found this a very difficult list of questions to write to ask you about programming because it's such a broad topic. But this is this is the thought experiment I came up with for somebody of your experience. If I was to hand you two to four weeks of programming for an affiliate, just give you it on on a piece of paper. What's the very first thing that you would look for or the very first thing that you would assess to see if it was an effective program or not? What's the very first question you'd ask the person who gave it to you? Uh, the first thing I'd warm up, uh, excuse me, the first thing I'd ask is, uh, you know, do you have a warm up and a cool down plan? Okay. You know, that's kind of the first thing I would look at there. Um, Why is that so important? Because I believe even the, 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 the any programming, regardless of how well it is or isn't thought out, can be made more effective by an effective warm up and an effective cool down. Okay. And there's a long list of reasons there, you know, whether yep. it's just simply physically preparing athletes, whatever, community building, uh, technique refinement, list goes on. Okay. So that's kind of what I would look at. I'd, I'd want to know what they're doing there. Um, from there, what I would look at is just simple things. Uh, just is there some variance in terms of time? Is there variance in terms of loading? Yeah. And is there variance in terms of, I don't want to say necessarily movement, but maybe movement function, upper body, lower body, push, pull, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. Those would be the first couple things I would look at. Has the the programming itself and the, and the philosophy around programming, because hand plan has been going for, for some time now. How many years would it be going? Yeah, I think, gosh, I think they're over five years now. I came on with them over the last year. But yeah, I think they've been doing it for about five years. Okay. Um, so you were involved in, in the programming of the sanctional event? Is, is, that, is that correct? We programmed for the uh, Asia CrossFit Championship, and we're going to do that again this year. And then we're also going to program for South Fit in Argentina, which will be in December. Okay. Um, have you found that enjoyable and, and different to program for, for sanctional events like that? Having been a competitor, I get really jazzed up about the idea of making other competitors suffer. <laughs> you know, it's, cool to be, it's, it's nice to be on that end of the stick. But um, I actually, I find it really stressful because, you know, I get it when people want to make the spectator friendly event too without sacrificing the real test of fitness. Um, and that makes things a lot harder. You know, th there, are, there are confines you're dealing with. You can't have people at a venue for not in 10 hours because you want to have like a you know three really long events in a row so there's just so there's so many other things to think about at that level um I've, I've definitely learned a lot about programming and just you know running events and and testing athletes and just all the different things that you could possibly consider so I, i've enjoyed it it was more stressful than i thought it was going to be definitely a lot more going on there it gave me more respect for you know the longer I've gone to the games and seen what they do, it gives me more respect for when an event is run well. Yeah, like I guess that battle between testing fitness and viewer friendly, um, like your first time ever programming for something like that, did you get a little bit excited by let's have all these bells and whistles and make it make it really crazy? Or were you able to keep the essence of like simple couplets, triplets? Well, we ended up being simple couplets, triplets, you know, when we programmed for the Asia CrossFit Championship. But when we started, I'll tell you, you know, one example was we really wanted to do a touch and go clean and jerk test as our strength test. Cool. But then we got into this thing of like, well, how do we judge touch and go? Yeah. And, you know, how do we do that in a time frame? 
Mm. And what if one athlete does a certain weight touch and go? And so, you know, you start to just think about those things more. Yes. And it's funny. It, 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 and if you look at the games and regionals and the open too, like they've progressively added things in that are a little bit harder to judge yep. that are a little bit fancier. Um, but you know, they've, you can tell they're experimenting and they're learning and, and they're doing things better as athletes get better. So, um, yeah, you do get some really, you know, we had an idea for this, this South fit sanctional, which I won't say what it was, but it was this really cool idea to test some stuff outside of, you know, that you don't normally find equipment. You don't normally find in the gym, sure. but it was like, we just, we couldn't figure out a way to do it where it would be you know, reasonable and you could actually judge it accurately and it would be standardized for competitors, yeah. you know, and sure. you think about that kind of stuff more. So, yeah, that's the, uh, the, the simple tests still really work well and sometimes are the most fun. You know, I thought the games finale this year with the, the clean and jerk muscle up snatch was like, if you were in that stadium, it was out of control electric. And that, that was a very straightforward workout. Can I ask quickly about the games? Uh, what what role did you have this year? You were on demo team, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah how did you yeah. find that? Like that's that's another. You've seen it some, from so many angles now. What was it like being on the demo team? So yeah, I did the demo team this year, which which main the main role of the demo team is to go to the workout briefs and show you know just kind of do a walkthrough for the athletes as far as logistics and standards. Um, but leading up to that point, we do a lot of event testing. Okay. Um, you know, we arrive there a couple days early and we do a, a, a pretty decent amount of event testing, which is, which is really fun. Yep. Um, cause you get to use all the cool toys and be on the awesome field. And, and it's also kind of stressful cause you want to do a good job cause you, especially having been there, you care about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I really, I really like doing it. It's neat. It's neat to, you know, but having competed, it's neat to have that insight. Because when you're competing, you know, there are times when you're out there and you're like, what the hell are Dave and his team thinking? Like, this is awful, you know? And it's, it's yeah. kind of neat to see, the, to see the method to the madness. Can I ask you, and this is a topic that I feel like, at least on social media, it's been covered at length. But there's been a lot of changes to the games in the recent 12 months. And if you were if you had to give someone advice or if there's a particular thing that you think people are carrying on too much about, about the changes, where, where would you start? Like what, what, what do you think people need to step back and realize about these changes? Hmm. Hey, you know, it, I think it depends on their, their complaints. I, you know, I'm trying to think of some of the biggest complaints that I heard. I mean, you know, people were really bummed about you know change is always hard people were really bummed that regionals went away i yep. think there are more more options now with sanctionals which is really cool you know you see more you know in the sanctionals so far have been a you know a pretty big production the ones that yep. you know i've watched and follow along with so you know i think the production quality quality is getting there and um you know i think that i really liked the games this year yep um and maybe i'm biased because i'm close to it but um you know, people who complain, I think it's just always good to look at, okay, what did you like about it and what's still there? Okay. You and, know? What's, and, and what's the main thing that, like, I know there's lots that you would like about competitive CrossFit, but for you, what's the most enjoyable thing that has held steadfast in the last 12 to 18 months? I, I still think the test is, is very accurate. I still think the test is really fun to watch. Yep. I have, you know... I have really liked seeing how different sanctionals try and express their own test of fitness. Okay. You know, and different, different sanctionals have an opportunity to test certain things. You know, like there's some sanctionals you'll go to and you will not swim. Okay. And it's interesting for me to see athletes who will go to a sanctional like that, try and make it to the games and then go to the games and be shitty swimmers. Mm. You know, I, I kind of like, I like seeing those things, you know, so it's like, hey, you you found your way to the games, but um, did what you know? How easy was your route to the games compared to other people? And we still had that with with regionals too. Um, yep. I like that aspect of it a lot, and I I do I like I do like how the international um, piece is, is being highlighted. Yes. You know, I, I think that's a very cool part of CrossFit. I've been very fortunate to see the international community of CrossFit. I don't think every 
you know, everyone everywhere else in the world has. Yep. And, um, you know, we have a lot of cushy things, you know, in, in, in the U.S. in terms of CrossFit, at least, because it's been here the longest. Yes. And it's like I've gone other places in the world and saw them make do and just get shit done in affiliates that were, you know, like, you know, in the middle of nowhere yep. with the worst possible equipment. And um, so I really I like that part of it. I like the, the pressure now on the international community to step up and other company, other countries and parts of the world that have been had CrossFit for a while to kind of get eyes on that. I like that part of it. Dude, I think uh, something that I just noted in everything we've chatted about so far is that despite literally competing at the CrossFit Games as an individual, I, I can tell that at the heart of your thoughts are always the affiliates and, and what's going on on the ground level. I, I guess I want to I want to wrap up with you. There's this – we say it a lot on seminars that CrossFit has the ability to, to change many people's lives. Um, and I think probably the most tangible – changes that you can see uh to people at the bottom end who who i guess let's say the obese person that loses a lot of weight or somebody who moves away from heart disease and then there's people at the top end who make a competitive athlete lifestyle for themselves but there's this huge band of people in the middle who don't necessarily come in with any crazy health problems but are never either going to be a, a competitive athlete what what does CrossFit change in their lives? Because I know that you would coach a huge amount of those type of people. What's the biggest thing CrossFit can do for those people? Well, you know, I, I, I won't say that I, I know exactly what it does for them. You know, I'll tell you how, as a coach, I look at it. And, um, you know, I, I heard this from, from Pat Sherwood, who is a mentor of mine on seminar staff for a very long time, you know, and he now, uh, has a big role in CrossFit health. And Pat said, you know, you want people to come in the door and make it the best hour of their day. Sure. And um, I had another friend recently, he did an Instagram post that I really liked. And he basically said, you know, it's hard to get into routines. It's hard to learn discipline. But he said the one of the most important things is, is just always start your day off with a win, no matter how small. And his example was, I always wake up and make my bed. That's a <laughs> really small action. But if he finds positivity in that, I'll tell you from experience, and from seeing other people do it, it makes other positive actions easier. It's not a fucking guarantee. Sorry, excuse me. You know, it's not, it's not a guarantee, right? You know, like there are days I wake up and I make my bed and it's still a crappy day. <laughs> but, you know, so how I view, you know, for like that band in the middle you're talking about is if you come into my gym and you take a class, what I want to do is, is, is give you an hour of positivity, you know, whatever that is. Maybe it's a high five. Maybe it's a good job. Maybe it was just a place where you could come in and you know, sweat and shake off the, the, the cruddiness of your day. But um, it's to provide them, I think, a, with a consistent positive experience that allows them to carry that positive experience on with the rest of their rest of their day or their life. Or maybe it only lasts for the next, you know, 30 minutes. But sure. um, that's kind of how I that's that's what I view. That's what I view our, our job is. And the way we do that is, you know, through fitness. Dude, I think you've uh, you've summed that up perfectly. Um, if people are listening to this podcast and thinking I, I need to know more about this guy, I need to follow this guy. Where, where can we find you? Like what, what does a week consist of for you now? Are you still on the road doing seminars most weekends? Well, as you know, I mean, I, I I'm sad, but I'm also happy that this has happened. I mean, our seminar staff has grown pretty significantly in all corners of the world. So sure. there, there's a lot, there's less need for who've been doing it for a while to travel i still get to get out of, they let me out of the country once in a while yeah but um i still work pretty frequently probably at least three seminars a month a lot more regional a um, okay. lot, lot less travel internationally more more in the states usually east coast kind of deal um other than that i'm there i'm at my gym as i said earlier uh, myself austin and spencer are, are working on just growing the ham plan and really trying to make that uh you know our experience more accessible to mostly you know competitors but really mostly affiliates Okay. Um, that's really big focus over the last year. And then, uh, I recently started helping Austin and Denise Thomas, uh, who's also on seminar staff and been a good friend and colleague of mine for over a decade now. Um, I'm helping them with the coach development course, which is a CrossFit preferred course. And we, you know, coaches can come to, uh, to gym and 
us and at least all the things that we have done to try and make things go well and be successful. You know, we can't show them every way, but we can show them our way. Yeah. So we've been working on that. So yeah, I've been focused on that kind of stuff. And then the other thing is I should probably say this, right, is I got married a couple of weeks ago. So I'm trying to be a decent partner and a, and a decent husband. <laughs> I, I was I was gonna I was thinking to myself, do I need to ask that? Do I need to prompt him on no, this, yeah, or yeah. is he gonna, Get that he gonna bring this up? Hey, dude, uh, I'm really grateful for the chat with you. Um, I'm looking forward to catching up with you in a few weeks' time. Um, thank you very much for coming on Pounds to Kilos, man. Yeah, Ed, thank you for having me. It's it's really awesome to see you, and uh, I hope I get to chat with you soon. Cool, man.